Hi everyone, I'm Clive. Hey, and I'm Louis. I'm Akros. And today we're going to take you through the last episode, episode six, focused on ISO 19650 and closing out a project to see what we can learn from it. If we followed those first five webinars and we prepared the team for great project success and the delivery of the right asset information model at the end of it, everyone's happy. But how did we get there? Well, <laughs> Project execution is not really a straight line, not usually. There's many turns and twists and ups and downs for the project team that they have to work around and they'll find better ways of doing things, ways not to do things along the way. When we finish a project and we've got this great idea that we're going to gather all of these lessons learned, we have to meet with the project team. That's the first thing that we would do. And when we ask the project team where, where they are, usually, we find that they're running away from the project as far and as fast as they can. They're already on another project and it's very difficult to get them to come yeah. back and tell you what happened. It's not that they mean to, right? They just become bu busy naturally. But when they do come back to that project to gather lessons learned, we tend to find ourselves ciphering through old notes, meeting minutes, um, things that we can't even remember at times. And we find ourselves trying to come up with these ideas to improve the next project. So we end up with this huge list in, of improvements and sit there wondering, how are we actually going to implement these? All of these ideas ended up going to a committee. They, they aren't really our top priority at that time. Uh, <laughs> they take ages to implement. Um, they're not really proactive and they're more reactive uh, ideas that come to mind. And ultimately, we end up losing another opportunity Absolutely. And one of the great uh, resources is the UK BIM framework. They unpack the concept of lessons learned a little bit more. And there are a few really key concepts. One is making it part of the team's appointment documents. So making sure that they're aware of it contractually. Make sure that it happens throughout the project. Make sure that it's not something that's just an afterthought that happens at the end. And also providing some forms of templates and ideas around what you could do and what you should do. We have excellent example shared with us. This is a great one recently from a large campus owner that had collected a bunch of lessons learned at the end of a project. It was quite fun to, to put together just five, but five what we call proactive methods to manage the lessons learned process, to make it easier. Method number one, when you create a scope and you think that you've thought of everything, but actually you missed some things in the original scope that came up later on in the project these gaps or the ambiguity is a real opportunity for us to learn for the next project, but it's difficult to implement it. So what we have is ideas like this, where the underground services team says, I need the zone of influence under the foundations in order for me to then coordinate my underground services. In capturing that data in the project, here we're adding, the underground services team adds this model zones of influence item, simply drags a photograph in, adds the details required, adds any of the dependencies that might be required between that task and their task. When we are in the same project, in the same workflow, the team's able to turn on this set of unscoped items in the scope, and then they're able to see maybe in a future project, we should think about this item. And by dragging and dropping it into our project, we can then use it as a template for our mm -hmm. future projects. And, so and it closes out that loop. Yeah. And, you know, that one, that lesson learned came from a customer as, asked to actually put that zone of influence as part of the library or that content library that you'll find within within the app right now. It's something that you wouldn't have found in a classification like Uniformat. It could be a scope item that you repeatedly missed on projects. This is just a really good example of how bringing that scope and making sure that that's now available for that next project. Absolutely. So method two. Overproduction. When something has, has been produced too, too fast, too quick, with a click of a button actually um, following or using BIM methodology, we can, we can generate a huge amount of data. But if that's too early or too much, that's, that's going to result a lot of waste. So that's something part of evil BIM that we are fighting against. And if you've been following the, the webinars, you, you must have seen this, this graph on the right side. So you might have a, a beautiful coordination idea in place and, and plan. If, you, if that plan is not followed, then it might result some pipes, let's say, or some, some items, some pieces of equipment, some systems placed too early, which most likely, almost guaranteed, are going to be ending up in the wrong place. So it is, it's going to be remodeled, which means rework and waste, of course, additional time requires for doing that, and all the cascading problems that it brings with it itself that results additional rework in other teams as well. So that's something that we should definitely work against overproduction.
And the way of doing that is, of course, having the plan in place and, and following that plan, but also identifying if something was pr produced too early, too fast, too, too much, too many, is check the model. And for example, in this uh, stage four content, filter for the, the different statuses and look for something that, is, uh, that would be unlinked, that would not be attached to any of the tasks. And you might see that on, the, on stage four, we were just only requesting that the mains should be modeled. But if you, if you filter the model, you will find uh, some, some of the branches also modeled. And again, it's almost guaranteed that the architectural design is going to improve. Fixtures as well as walls are going to be moved around and um, all of a sudden the pipes are going to be in the wrong location. So you have to remodel those. This is something to identify that. And once you identify what, what should we do with that? I mean, it's, it's already too late, right? The lesson learned here is, uh, is not to wait till the end. So break, break the project down into smaller chunks, time-wise, location-wise, but make sure that, that you have an opportunity to check early how the models were created and rather start talking about these shorter cycles, these shorter sprints and capture the, the overproduction in this case as soon as possible and report it back to the team. Overproduction sounds great, but it actually causes the rework that Akash was talking about, which is a crazy waste on a project. The next one, method three, this one really is about how you capture and when you capture the ideas, the lessons. If you don't have an integrated workflow, if somebody's got to go off to another system or another place to be able to enter and manage those new ideas, then sometimes they're not going to do it. And sometimes they'll only do it at the last moment when they get asked to do. So there's traditional lessons learned capture processes and tools. Some of them are file-based, some of them are databases, but the challenge really is that they're not the everyday tools, so they're rarely used. And then you end up with this flood of requirements for improvement at the end of a project when everyone else is running to the next project and trying to get started. So the timing is not perfect. So we've got some great templates and methods to capture that, but it's not just the template, it's also inside of the tool that you're managing all of your documents today. Being able to capture lessons learned in another tab rather than having to go to a completely different system means that you integrate that whole workflow. And it does mean that we are also presenting all of the different templates like the post-occupancy evaluation and also the aftercare expectations. How are you going to make sure that you're learning and continually proactively improving the, the life and the experience of your customer? And this is all based on the uh, requirements for ISO 19650 and the great recommendations through the UK BIM framework. The other key to this is not just having a text-based document, but also a task. And here it's represented as a task that recurs every milestone that can have a set of requirements and a how-to and can be linked directly to that same tab. So we're going from the scope with a specific task. So in the scope, we're able to define all of the different steps, and this is the assignment matrix, all the different tasks, see that task, understand the checklist items, and then connect to the lesson learned in, whether it's a text-based form inside of Planoly or somewhere else. It can have responsibility and capture all of those things in the same place. The next one, method four. Louis, are you gonna help us on this one? Yeah, this is very common, it's a broken feedback. Um, not all these improvements, updates, make it back to a template. In a traditional workflow, we tend to download a template from a place um, that could be outdated. We then make changes to these documents. We publish and share those. So we actually lose some of those updates that or adjustments we've made as soon as we, we PDF them. And then we go out and share those to, for everyone else. Um, so we even lose some of those comments that we've gathered and we end up with this static document with no history. And if there is a history, it's pretty scattered all the way around. Within Plannerly, any administrator can access any project at any time. They can access the documents, go through versions, go through the history of these documents, see how much they've evolved, see how teams have added the content or whether the structure of that section has changed completely. It can tell a story whether that item or those lessons learned have been implemented for that for that next project. And ISO 19650 talks about information containers. And the concept here is not just a, not a whole document, it's a piece of information that has a full history that connects from when somebody uses it from a template to the end of life on that project. And then the team that's using templates simply gets access to that template. And by creating it, 
they know that they're always accessing the latest template. There's no fear that they're using an old document or an old template that's somewhere on their system. It's always going to be using the latest and greatest template. The last one, so we're making the same mistake time and time again and not learning from it. How do we identify when that's occurring and how do we actually get to and use a lean workflow to get to the root cause of it? Our friend Albert says that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And unfortunately, we tend to do that a lot in our industry. And it's really because there's not great opportunities to capture midstream and spend time on that. Here we're showing an example where we're just creating a simple report with some scope details that say these are all of the items that need fixes. And the principle behind this is it's a really rich detailed report of only the troublesome items that have the history of who is responsible for it and what has been and what hasn't been done and any attachments and the descriptions and everything that you need to be able to go through this fun exercise of the five whys to identify the root cause. If you ask the question why five times in a row, you're very likely to get to a root cause. Louis, did you want to walk through this one? Yep. Why did the team miss those requirements? You asked why. They might say, I didn't know it was my responsibility. Why is that? It wasn't on my scope of work. Why is that? The requirements were not assigned to me. Why? And maybe the owner needed more help to share that information. So quickly, we found a root cause. Uh, this, this method and this process can certainly help you get to that root cause. Very cool. So we talked about five different lessons that you could not wait until the end of the project for, but you could iterate on using a more integrated workflow, tracking anything that you missed, and then having the opportunity to improve your scoping templates as you go, making it more focused reviews, shorter cycles, a leaner approach, integrating the opportunity to collect the lesson learned, whether it's a good or a bad lesson, instead of it being a completely separate system, simply being another tab that teams can have access to and update, then being able to track from origin to exit of a project, everything that has changed from the template and have that full history and knowledge of who's changed it, why they've changed it, what the status changes have been, making sure that improvements are not lost, digging in to find the root cause and not making the same mistake twice, not becoming, not being insane as Albert Einstein would say. We've got a few resources to share with you. The first is access to these diagrams that we've been using throughout the webinars. You can find them on this link. All of the webinars in this series are recorded and they are available on this webinar page. The previous episodes that we've looked at, one was looking at templates and how we can use those to kickstart the process. Two was how we use those to tender, so creating exchange information requirements. The third one was about contracting and having responses that go to an appointment set of documentation. That contract then goes to production, creating deliverables and QAing and making sure that you get the delivery of the right information. And then episode six today about closing out the project.